At Christmas, more than any time in the year, we should remember that just when we think we know how things are going to go, something unexpected happens. I forgot my announcements, but I didn't forget the doxology, but I left it out. You know, the song that we just sang is a fantastic song. It's well known. It's been sung across the years. Many different artists have come up with different, a variety of versions. But here's this drummer boy. He has no status, no money, no power, no privilege. But he has his love for the drum, and he's been invited to see the newborn king. And all he has is his drum, and so he plays. And the song ends, then he smiled at me, me and my drum. You know, there's nothing more to be said. The ultimate affirmation from the baby in the manger, Jesus, the king of heaven. There's a great truth in that. God's love is not about our performance. It's not about how well he played the drum. It's about the gift of love and humility as he played his best. The Bible says repeatedly, at least four or five times the words are written textually, that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Peter wrote that we should cast all, give all our anxieties over to God because he cares for you. But, he added, humble yourself if you want him to lift you up. So pride and self-sufficiency will bring you down, and it'll keep you down, but God's promise is to give grace to the humble. And his promises are always more real than your circumstances. Now, that's an amazing thing. We said it a number of times throughout this series on family trees and genealogy. God's promises are more real than your circumstances. Now, if you think about that, that's a pretty profound truth. Because right now, when you're sitting there in a chair and all the things that are in your head, that feels like the most real thing. Or some emotional challenge or problem or excitement or anxiety that feels like the most real thing. But God's promises are more real. And so we've been talking about the genealogy, and uh, that's important. And we'll see why a little bit more. But today we're going to talk about Rahab. And I, I'm pointing up there, but actually we don't have a PowerPoint. It's more like the story. And so you can listen to the story. And Rahab is the mother of Boaz. She's the great-great-grandmother of King David. But we won't get into David today, and we won't talk about Boaz, but we will talk about Rahab. Rahab lived about 14 or 1,500 years before Jesus. Think about that. I mean, how many people do you know just off the top of your head that you can go back about 1,400 years and remember their name? Out of all the people who've lived, all the people in the world. And yet we remember Rahab. She's mentioned four times in the New Testament. The New Testament written so much later, the people remembered her story. They told Rahab's story. Every generation knew who she was. This pagan prostitute from a bad city that was destroyed by the people of Israel. And yet she's remembered for her faith. A person with no experience or knowledge of God. And then think about Christmas. Mary, probably the most famous woman who ever lived. Mary, the mother of Jesus. She's described as a young virgin engaged to be married. She comes from a humble village and a loving family in Judea. And yet she's also remembered for her faith. Faith is really a gift from God. It's a Christmas gift. Faith is not from your parents. It's not from your people. 
whether you're from the humble village or the great city of Jericho, faith is not from your profession or your hobby. Faith is not even a feeling. We like to feel that we have faith, but faith is not really even a feeling. Faith is not just an idea. Faith, the Apostle Paul said, is a gift that God gives to everyone and to anyone, everyone and anyone who's ready to receive and believe. I just wanted to say that again because think about Rahab and think about Mary. Mary's the kind of person that you expect, okay, Mary's the perfect pe person. Many people in the world, some people even celebrate her as actually the mother of God. Can you imagine having that kind of a reputation to live up to, the mother of God? Well, she's not really the mother of God, but it's a theological debate that they play with the Latin and the Greek and go back and forth. But Mary is this person you think of, and she's been presented to us, and the story is just like the model of perfection. And so you say, okay, a person like that should have faith, but what does that have to do with me? And then there's Rahab. And so God gave them both faith, and they're both remembered for their faith. You know, the story of Christmas is a story of God giving faith by sending Jesus to show us a pathway to peace. John 3, 16 and 17. And I just like to read this because we don't read it here very often. John 3, 16 and 17. I think it's there in your notes, Beatriz. Está ahí escrito. I just want to make sure we keep up with the translation. John 3, 16 and 17 is like a summary of the Christmas story because it reminds us that God so loved the world, he loved the world and the people in it so much that he sent his only son, Jesus, that whoever, whoever, anyone and everyone that believed in him would not perish but would have eternal life. One of those promises of God that's really more real than our circumstances. It doesn't feel real. Eternal life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to bring salvation to the world. So many times we hear and we think, and people have the idea and they talk to me, that God is just like this angry guy. And at Christmas, many of you, if you know the English songs, and you turn on the radio and somebody in one of the nursing homes said to me, and I'm not sure if she was fully aware of what she was saying, but maybe she was. And I said, well, we're going to sing some Christmas songs. What's your favorite song? She said, I'm up to here with Christmas songs. Like, you know, no more Christmas songs. But then when we were done, she said, is that it? You're going to sing, sing some more. And so, but there's a song here, you know, that um, Santa Claus is coming to town. So you better watch out, you better not pout, and you better, you got to do everything right because Santa's coming and he's got his list and he's checking it twice and these things and it's this Santa and if you've been naughty, then no gifts for you. And so, and many people think of God that way too. God's got his list and he's checking it off and he's seen what you did and that's why we sang the drummer boy and that's why we're talking about Rahab and Mary. God is giving the gift of faith at Christmas and it doesn't matter what you've done and where you're from. As much as it matters, is your heart humble and open to him? So let's look at Rahab and Mary for a moment. You know, the genealogies and the family trees are important throughout the ancient world. It helps us to understand our identity and our connection with the past and the future. You and I live in this little moment in time. And the older we are, the more we realize how fast life is. How can it be so short? And, but before you were here in this world, there were people making choices that impact your life today. Where you're from, things that you think, things that you do. There's all kinds of choices. After us, in the future... People's lives will be impacted by the choices we've made. There will be consequences for our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Some of our decisions will shape our life's destiny. 
It helps us to remember the people who experience God's good work in their life and form part of his kingdom. You know, choices you make today about money, about relationships, and about faith are helping determine the options and the limits you'll have in 2019. I've met people that won't do business with someone because their grandparents had a feud. Their grandparents say, well, okay, well, that's a decision that's still affecting us years later. I've had relatives that don't speak. No relatives from Uruguay. Some of you know I'm Uruguayan. I don't tell the Uruguayan stories. I've had relatives on my dad's side of the family, who none of you know, that wouldn't speak to each other for a decade because of some kind of an offense. And those things have consequences that get passed on and on throughout the years. But Rahab is a story of a woman who broke through all the stereotypes. She overcame every obstacle, and against impossible odds, she changed her life and the life of her family forever. She became a hero to all the girls who, who heard her story. If you don't believe me, think about this. Rahab lived 3,500 years ago, and we're still talking about her today. So Joshua chapter 2. If you have a Bible and you want to look, find the book of Joshua. Joshua is the sixth book of the Bible. Because the first five books are the books of Moses. And then Moses is the great leader, and Moses dies, and he's handed over the leadership to his number two guy, Joshua. Joshua was one of the guys, and I'll just tell you this while you're, while you're looking for Joshua chapter 2. Joshua is one of the original 12 spies that 40 years before had been sent into this land called Canaan to check it out. And 10 spies came back and they said, you know what? These cities are huge. The people are mighty. They're giants. This is like not something we can manage on our own. And there were two spies that had checked it out, and they said, you know what, this is going to be tough, but with God on our side, we can do this thing. Well, the, 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 the whole crowd of people voted, and they voted for 10 spies instead of the two spies, and so they never went into Canaan. And 40 years passed, and a whole generation of the older people were gone, and the old guys were the two spies who said, we can, Joshua and Caleb. And now it's their turn. And Joshua is the leader. And so again, he sends out two spies. They've just crossed the Jordan River, and they go in and to spy out the land. And so verse 1 says, Joshua secretly sent two spies from Siddim, and he says, go look over the land, especially Jericho. And so they went, and they entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab, and they stayed there. And so they're there for a while, and the king of Jericho was told, look, some Israelites have come, and they're spying out the land. So the king of Jericho, the king of the city, sends a message to Rahab. And he says, bring out the men that have come to you and entered your house because they've come to spy out the land. But the woman who had taken the two men, she had taken them and hidden them. And she said, I know these, these guys came, but I didn't know where they came from. And so at dusk, when it was time to shut the city gates, the men left. And I don't know where they went. She added in the part about dusk because it's kind of hard to see. It wasn't well lit. So, you know, these guys, they left. I don't know where they went. But go quickly, and maybe you'll catch up with them. If she hadn't said at dusk they were leaving and they're on their way, maybe those soldiers would have inspected her house and found these guys. So she's clever, and she deceives the soldiers, and they go running out the door to look. And before the spies who are hiding in the house, up on the roof, lie down for the night. She goes up and she tells them, I know, verse 9, that the Lord has given this land to you and that a great fear of you has fallen on us. All the people who live in this whole region, this country, are melting in fear because of you. We heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea when you came out of Egypt. And she goes on, she says, Our hearts melted, everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now, I probably shouldn't add this in, but when I read and study, I like to go, I read what the archaeologists have said, what the different people say about the culture and the background, and to try to understand, and then there's not time to tell about it. But 
I like to know. And the two, three great myths from the ancient time, ways of explaining the world and how it happened, all have to do with the gods fighting with each other. And the god of heaven and earth in the, the Babylonian myth and the myth of Marduk is they have to defeat the god of the sea. The god of the sea is the most powerful god in the reality, like Neptune was. And then if you want to be more powerful, you have to beat the god of the sea. And that's what this wor woman, Rahab's worldview is. And they heard, and all the region had heard, the most famous story of ancient times is how the people of Israel somehow crossed the Red Sea like dry land, and the Egyptian army right behind them followed them, chased them, and drowned in the same sea. And their bodies washed up on the shore, and she says, you know what, for 40 years we've known that story, and the people are terrified because they know there's a people coming with a great God. So verse 12, Swear to me by the Lord, by your God, that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father, my family, her whole, her whole family. So they say they'll do that. She lets them down a rope out of the window. And you can ask me about that if you're interested, how they get the window and the wall and the whole bit. But I won't bore you with it now. And they go on. And she says, you know what? When you get out of here, you need to hide up in the hills. The city is the, on the main plain. And you look out one way and you're looking down to the river. And that's where they went to look, because the people of Israel the, are out that way. And if you look the other way, is heading up into the hill country. She said, go hide in the hill country for about three days, because those got, scouts are going to look for you for about three days, and then they'll come back. And so wait about three days, and then go. And so they did. And so it's a fascinating story. One day, just like any other day, she was expecting, I don't know, to sing the doxology, and then all of a sudden it was in the program, and then it wasn't there. So what happened? Like life changed, the unexpected happened, and what is Rahab going to do? Now she had a crisis, and she apparently wanted something better for her life. But when we go into a crisis, and it could be at Christmas, we tend to respond the way we've always responded, the way we've been taught, the way our family responded, the way our emotions tell us. And so... If we want to be a different person, we have to think, we have to reflect, we have to get some help from outside of ourselves usually and say, how can I change this way that my brain is thinking, is working? Well, Rahab had apparently done some of that work. She's not happy taking people's money for a job she doesn't enjoy, working for a king who doesn't care for her. She's probably wondering if there really is a God who cares about justice about prostitutes, about her. She wants something more real. Rahab recognized her need. She admits she cannot change her circumstances. She is locked into this world, this men's world, this world of poverty and injustice and a lot of evil that was a part of that community in Jericho. But she wants to be part of something bigger. She wants to be able to believe that there's more to this life. And so she recognized her opportunity. She didn't just see these men as men on a mission, these spies. She looked at them and she said, these men are on a mission from God. You know, everybody's doing something, but not everybody's doing something for God. And Rahab recognized her opportunity. She receives the spies. She says, there's a new reality that's starting. There's a new king coming to town, and she's willing to risk everything, her life and the life of all her family, to trust these people and their God. And she hides them, and she lets them out of the window, and she's not going to hear from them again or see them again until destruction is falling on the city. So what can she do? Trust and wait. The spies eventually made it home safely. They told Joshua all about it. They eventually marched to Jericho. They make it. There's a sort of a miraculous event. You can read the story. The walls fall. The city's destroyed. Many people are killed. But Joshua gave orders to go find Rahab and save her and her family. They're rescued. They join the people of Israel. They begin a new life, and her story's remembered to this day. 
She actually marries the son of the leader of the people of Judah. And so personal growth involves finding out what you need to be a better version of you. And in emotionally healthy spirituality, we talk about the fact that one indicator of emotional health is to be able to ask for what you need. To be able to ask for what you need. And so Rahab was able to ask for what she needed from the spies. She said, I need your mercy. I need you to remember me. I want out of this life that I'm in. I need something different. Let me tell you, God's interest in you, his care for you are not primarily, is not primarily determined by anything you do or you have done. Or he'd have never come for Rahab. Rahab didn't deserve any goodness by our standards. But God doesn't look on the outside appearance. God looks, Jesus said, on the heart. And he saw a person who in humbleness said, I need something else. And so the scriptures are pretty clear. God opposes proud people. He will not hear your prayer, the scriptures say, if you ignore the poor, if you promote injustice. The Bible says that God hates lies. He hates gossip. He hates rebellious attitudes. But he shows mercy and grace to the humble. He cares about the suffering of a widow, an orphan, a child. Rahab's story reminds us that God's love crosses all the boundaries It breaks down all the walls. It overcomes prejudice, racism, misogyny, mistreating women, and even religious fundamentalism and parochialism. The idea that my way is the only way. God's love overcomes that. Think about Mary. Her story is told with the most detail in the Gospel of Luke. She received an angel. I don't think she planned for it. I don't think she knew the angel was coming. It wasn't in her agenda. It wasn't written down. But a messenger from God who all of a sudden appeared and told Mary, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Every time an angel appears, not every time, because the Bible tells us angels appear among us and we don't know who they are. But when the people know that it's an angel, the angel always has to say, wait, wait, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid because the people are like, Afraid. I mean, if an angel appeared here, bam, we would be freaked out. So the angel would say, don't be afraid. She wasn't expecting visitors any more than Rahab. But like Rahab, she was faced with a choice to make and little time to think. She receives the angel like Rahab received the spies. She recognizes this is a whole new opportunity, a new reality. A new king is coming. And she chose to risk everything, her reputation, her relationships in the community, everything, by trusting this angel and his God. You know, Mary and Rahab are practically opposites. They both had the unexpected visitors that led to conversations about trading in their old life for a whole new way of, experience, trust, a whole new way of experiencing how to trust God. So their circumstances are different. Your circumstances and mine are different. But both women left us a legacy of faith. Ultimately, both these women led the way for us to be here today. So Christmas is an annual invitation. Every year Christmas comes around. And it can be like the routine. Oh, yeah, Christmas. I've had it up to here with the music, so many things in the stores. All the thing, Christmas, just the routine, it's the same thing. The family comes, we know what we're eating for dinner. But if you can remember the wonder of God coming and saying, this is my annual invitation to you to remember, I want to do something unexpected in your life. If you think you know what's going to happen tomorrow, you don't. Do you think you know what's going to happen next year? You could guess, and you might be right. Might just keep going. Life does. But unexpected things happen. Rahab had to choose between Jericho and Joshua. The life she knew or the life she hoped to find by faith. She recognized her need, 
and she requested mercy from the spies. And then she trusted and she waited. She did not know what the outcome would come, what, what the outcome would be. And when those city walls fell and a warrior started coming through, she still didn't know what the outcome would be. But she gathered her family and she trusted and she waited. Mary had to choose between Caesar and Christ, the life she knew or the life she hoped to find by faith. She recognized her destiny. She requested mercy. And then she trusted and she waited. What about you? What is in front of you? God knows your name. He knows your name. If he knew about Rahab, he knows you. And he has a place for you, like he did for Rahab and for Mary, among his people, in his family, at his table. What do you need to trust God for? Are you willing to wait? You know, waiting is not passive. We think waiting means like, okay, I have to sit here. I'm sitting here in this service waiting for the preacher to stop. I'm just waiting, and we're just like waiting, and waiting is like wasting time. We think of that. But just think for a minute. You've thought about Rahab. You've thought about Mary. Waiting is not passive. Rahab got busy while she waited. She had to get the spies out of her house safely. She had to get them out of her city. Her life was at risk. If the king knew that she was betraying them, how long do you think she'll last? And so she's busy. She counseled them. If you read the chapter, she advised them on how to elude their pursuers. She had some serious work to do, and a war was coming. But she trusted and she waited, even while she worked. Mary was not passive. She hid this mystery in her heart. And so the pictures will show us Mary angelically sitting there with this mystery hidden in her heart. Can you imagine what it would be like to hide that mystery in her heart? Most of us can't hide mysteries. Many people cannot keep a secret even for a moment. We've got to tell somebody. And Mary has this news that I am engaged to Joseph, and he's a righteous person, he's a just person, he has his reputation, and my family has a reputation, and all of a sudden, I think I'm pregnant. And an angel appeared to me and told me the hope of Israel, the Messiah, is coming through me. And yet she has to go back and have tea with the family and smile and act like nothing happened while she waits for God to reveal himself to somebody else. She can't tell anyone. She got the word clearly from the angel, but she makes a plan. She packs her belongings. She figures out where can I go, who will have me, and she leaves town for an extended visit to her Aunt Elizabeth and some better opportunities for the baby growing inside her. In the waiting, neither, lead, neither lady is passive. They are transformed, and they are empowered by faith. God is at work. His promises are more real than their circumstances. We can read Rahab's story, and it's just like a story. It's like a quick children's story. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. She let the spies out, and they came back. They saved her. Why would they save this woman? Can you imagine that in today's world? The collateral damage, you say, you know, it's just, that's just part of war. You know, so this process, yes, yeah, she helped us, but I mean, she had to. What else was she going to do? And that woman would have never survived in many of the battles, the way they're fought today, perhaps. But God was at work. He had this whole different future envisioned. I mean, that's why in the Gospel of Matthew, the very first verses of the New Testament, the writers are saying, oh yeah, and Rahab was the mother of Boaz. Why do they say that? Because everybody knows who Rahab is. Not because she was a prostitute, not because she betrayed Jericho, not because she saved the spies, but because God did something that was completely unbelievable. God had his chosen people, right? The good people, these, the good guys. But somehow, God's mercy was so great, no one could even imagine that he was doing something in Rahab's life. And he rescued her because of her faith. And like, people thought they knew what God was like, but they were wrong. God had a plan even for Rahab. And so that so changed the way people were 
thinking about God, they're so amazed, they just keep telling the story. Are you worse off than Rahab? Are you better than Mary? Would you trust Christ this Christmas with your life? That no matter where you're from, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, the most important thing is, where are you going to go now? Where are you going to go now? Who will you trust? Which king will you serve? If you like Bob Dylan, you remember his song, You've got to serve somebody. Christ reminds us, Christmas reminds us, that the Christian faith is rooted deeply in God's redemptive work all the way in the past. His healing and reconciling power right here in the present and his powerful, hope-filled promises for the future. Would you trust Christ with your life and live empowered by faith while you wait for his promises to be fulfilled? The two verses I quote the most at Christ Church over the years. So one is in James 4, 6, but it's also in 1 Peter 5, 5. It's also several times in the Psalms and the Proverbs. But it says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And the other verse that we quote over and over again is Romans 15, 13. If you go on our Wi-Fi, that's the password, Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. There's that little caveat, that little part that says, okay, he doesn't just automatically, if you're going to be proud and self-sufficient, don't count on the joy and peace. If you're going to ignore the poor and promote injustice, don't wait for the joy and peace. It's not coming. But, God gives grace to the humble. And if you'll trust him, your life can overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. These are the verses and chapters to carry with you in Christmas as you reflect on the year ahead and what kind of person you're becoming. Pride will bring you down, but God, through Jesus Christ, can bring you back to a place of joy and peace. That's the wonder and mystery of Christmas. His promises are more real than our circumstances. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love. We thank you that these reminders from Rahab, from Mary, but really from so many different people across history remind us that you're not looking at our performance. Did we make all the right choices? Because we didn't. Did we do all the right things? Because we didn't. Did we achieve perfection? Well, we didn't. We've fallen short in many ways, but your grace and your mercy and your love are great enough, are good enough, are powerful enough to give us the faith to make a new start. To say, Lord, I've, where I am, I want to follow you. I need to learn to trust you. I need to know how to wait. Rahab didn't know how to trust or wait, but she made her way day by day. Mary didn't know how to do this thing about being the mother of Jesus, but she found her way day by day. And so, Lord, take us today. Help us to make that next step. Help us to trust you in our hearts with all of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>